Hello and welcome to Breathwood. My name is David Yates. It has been a long time since I've done a video. Today I want to talk about something that falls in the realm of something called compression, although I'm mostly going to call it mouth shape, and it is a way to drastically improve your sound. Before I do that though, I just need to say a few other things. Uh, obviously for all of us, COVID-19 has really changed the world, changed life. Um, and in my case, all of my in-person gigs have completely stopped. So that means a lot of my work that I do with people, whether one-on-one -on -one or in groups or for audiences, it's all done. Um, and so I'm relying on online work. Uh, that includes teaching lessons. That includes Patreon. And I wanted you to know that supporters on Patreon are uh, helping me experiment with something that's pretty cool. We've been meeting on Zoom and having little, almost like workshop discussion sessions about the Dig. So we all get on there and talk about the things we're working on and then share tips and tricks. And of course that means I end up teaching little bits and pieces of things, but they teach each other as well. So Patreon supporters have access to this, um, which means it's a really great time to jump on my Patreon account and offer some kind of monthly pledge. Okay, so I've been offering this to people from 15 a month and up. So check that link below. Any amount of support, even if it's down at the two or five dollar a month range, any little bit helps right now considerably. This is also an amazing time for online lessons. Those have taken off. I'm, I'm doing a lot of online teaching now, more than ever before. So I'm here if you would like to continue to expand your didgeridoo journey, whether beginner or more advanced. Okay, so let's jump into mouth shape. Um, this is interesting because beginning players and beginner teachers, like I used to be, will often hear a beginner sound and not quite understand why it's good, but not great. So here's what I'm talking about. I'm gonna take a very simple couple of sounds like do and D and just play do, D, do, D, do. And I'll breathe a little bit too. So what's, what's happening here and what's right and what's maybe, what maybe could be improved? What's right is that I'm getting the drill. What's right is that you can hear the syllables. You can hear the O and the E to some degree. There's some articulation. What's right is I am breathing with it. You know, it's basically the sound of the ditch. But if I adjust a few things, key things in my mouth, here's what it can sound like and here's what we in the beginning, especially, often are aiming for, but we don't know how to get there. You hear that difference? I'm going to do that again. I'm going to make sure I'm not blasting you too much. I'm going to do that again, and uh, I'm going to switch between the more beginner mouth shape and the more advanced mouth shape. Okay, I think you might get the point now. So, what's happening? I've heard it described by a few different people. One in particular, I'm going to call him Robert J because I can't pronounce his last name. It's German. He, uh, he gave me a lesson in something he calls compression. And a lot of teachers talk about compression. And uh, for us beginner to intermediate players, it's, you know, it's this concept. How do, I, how do I get compression? The idea, as it was described to me, is we take the air and we compress it. And when you have more compressed air, you have a cleaner, tighter sound where more of the frequencies in the sound are exaggerated. Now, I've been sitting with this, thinking about that. Is that true? You know, if you think about an air compress compression machine, it can be used for something like a, a staple gun, and it's quite strong. So compression gives you more power. 
I don't know if you could hear the difference, but I went from this kind of loose, floppy sound to suddenly more power. So yeah, compression gives us power. Now what about the frequencies? Here I start to maybe diverge from some of the common way of thinking about compression because the other key concept here is mouth shape. The floppier sound is just an open mouth cavity, the tongue sort of in the middle, and when it articulates the D and the DO, it's like I'm just speaking. D, DO, D, DO, D, DO. That's a very small change in the mouth, um, and it's not clear enough to actually get the sounds we want, D, DO, D, DO. The talking D, DO is different from the didgeridoo D, DO. When we play didgeridoo and want to emphasize the sounds, we got to make a really big D shape, really push it as much as we can. When you say E, the tongue moves forward and flattens out and, and shrinks the, the cavity through which the air is moving. There's some of your compression right there. When you say O, O, like a really exaggerated O, O, it's quite round. The E, which is a smaller, tighter space, highlights and amplifies the higher frequencies. That's why it sounds like there's this high-pitched buzz or whine. And the O emphasizes slightly lower frequencies, so that's why those frequencies drop. And that's all over top the fundamental note we're hearing the didgeridoo make. So just listen for yo higher to lower overtone frequencies. If I do this with what I call talking tongue, okay, EO is a lot less extreme and you don't get nearly the range or the clarity of those overtones. As a beginner teacher, I often told people, just make the mouth shape of E and O and explore that. Now I know that's not enough. We've got we've to really shape it and hone it. The, the, the uh, comparison I've been using in my mind is almost like pottery. Imagine wet clay and you've kind of got it into the rough shape. It'll, it'll work. It'll hold liquid, let's say, if it's a bowl. But if you hone it and polish it and shape it, then it just looks more beautiful and does its job more beautifully. Flutes, for example, aren't some random internal shape. They have a very well-defined shape inside. Usually it's a tube shape or a round internal shape like an ocarina. We want to do the same with our mouths. Think of making the clearest, most defined, small shape you can, and that will move you toward clearer sound. But now that's only part of the story. This compression idea adds another variable. And the best way I can approach it in my own understanding is to make the position in the mouth that you would make to do a hiss sound like a cat. Now you can change the pitch of even that sound. That's affected by where in the back of your mouth your tongue is touching the top. That's further back, so Darth Vader. Pretend you are copying one of those steamers for steaming milk, right, for a latte. It's that place back there. We're taking the air chamber, okay, and making it a lot tighter. And we're clarifying the shape that we're using. So we're adding speed and intensity and power that's going to help highlight the frequencies we want to hear. Uh, and we're making the shape less nebulous. It's more defined. So you can play just a drone, open mouth, tongue, wherever, and then slowly start to move your tongue from open to the hiss. And I don't think my microphone likes that. <laughs> that difference now a few other things happen as you increase the intensity of your airflow the lips can't just sit there maintaining the same amount of tone they have to tone up slightly to hold back the additional air pressure low air pressure low lip tone is needed 
high air pressure, higher lip tone is needed. It's always a balance. If your lip tone is too intense, too strong, and you have weak air, you won't even get a buzz. If your lip tone is too weak and you have strong air pressure, they'll just blow out. You're always looking for a balance. So as you increase the air pressure, you need to increase the lip tone. Uh, and it's within reason. You're trying to find the right, the sweet spot where it really sings together. So open up to hiss, but just before you actually end up hissing into the ditch. You hear those high overtones? I'm not even trying to make the E sound, but I'm getting some of those higher frequencies. So what if I raise the back of the tongue in that hiss position and then try for an actual E, which is more of the front of the tongue lifting as well. Yeah, there's so much more texture there. So whether you want to call it compression only or mouth shape or some combination of compression and mouth shape, that's what we're going for. And we want to start to convert all of our playing for the most part to use that positioning. So now when I'm going do, di, do, that back part of the tongue stays lifted the whole time. So it kind of gives me a funny image of the tongue. You know, if this is, if it's going do, di, this is hard to emulate, but it's basically touching toward the front. Do, D, Do, D. Now, instead, you've got this curve back here as it's going Do, D, Do, D. This curve stays consistent. This is the back of the tongue, right? Can you tell that? <laughs> so let's uh, apply this to one more concept for now, and then I'll leave you with that. It's a lot to take in. Um, Something like tawaha, 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 tawaha. Open the mouth cavity to prepare some air pressure. To squeeze that forward as you breathe in, and then exhale back to the drone from the lungs. You've got lungs, mouth, lungs. If you want to think of it that way, the air is going from the lungs, then from the mouth, then from the lungs. Make sense? Lungs, face, lungs. And you breathe in, in the middle. So big open mouth shape. It's kind of general. I've kind of got it. I'm getting the concept. Here's how that sounds. So someone might get this and then be like, I've got it, but it just sounds kind of, it sounds kind of, neutral characterless like the, it's not it's not ditch you know back of the tongue now it's going to stay lifted i can still use the cheeks or some jaw or tongue movement to push the air when i breathe in but that that placement back there is going to stay as clearly as possible in the almost hiss position the whole time so here's um, no compression and then compression or uh, loose mouth shape and then tight mouth shape. I'll switch back and forth. See if you can hear the difference. You know, an interesting side effect of learning this is you can actually get some speed going in a way that feels and sounds clear and is more, it's more effortless actually. So there I'm kind of losing it. Big open mouth shape, it's a little mushy, and then keeping it really tight, 
I'm still working on this. I've kind of gone back and forth on trying to understand it or get it to happen. And I just know that my best sound happens when I'm keeping that mostly in place. Now, final little thing. When would you not want this? This topic came up yesterday with the group of Patreon folks as we were chatting about this idea. Um, if the tighter mouth shape helps give you more power, you know, higher air pressure, more intense overtones. You would want to drop it to stop when you don't want those things. So if you're playing more meditative style um, and you want just more of the fundamental tone of the didgeridoo, you might back off on that. As soon as I want those other sounds, I bring in the, the positioning that gives me more compression and more of a frequency, a high range of frequency response. So there you go. <laughs> compression, mouth shape, however you want to look at it. Remember that these videos that I do are as much about me sharing my process as me teaching. I've gotten some interesting flack in the didgeridoo world for teaching things I don't know. Um, I'm teaching things that I'm learning. So that's why I'm able to teach them because I am in it trying to figure it out right along with you. <laughs> um, if you have any questions or comments um, or requests, please let me know in the comments below. Uh, I don't always get to them right away, but I do eventually see them. And again, the link to join me on Patreon is right down there in the description. At least give it a click, take a look, see if you can find it in your heart and bank account to offer a bit of support every month. Um, you can join me for lessons. There are options for that. You can gain access to a little mini group where people can share bits and pieces of things they're learning. Um, Patreon supporters are getting an average of one new video a month or sorry, one new video a week. So generally every Friday, I try to get at least a video. If it's not a video, it's some other bit of homework or a challenge or something to work on. There's always material to work on, a lot more than I've been putting here on, on YouTube. So that's another benefit of joining. So, um, and these little Patreon, or not Patreon, Zoom meetups have been really cool. And I wanna, I wanna expand on that and keep those growing. So, um, people over there on Patreon get to join me for more regular chats where we get to just jam on ideas. So there you go. Enough talking. Thank you so much for watching. Thank you for all your support, beautiful comments. It's, uh, it's been amazing to be on this journey with you. I hope you're staying as safe as you can out there, not getting too stir crazy, finding productive ways to deal with this strange time we're in, staying connected. And if you ever want to reach out for any kind of support or even just to say hello, I would love that. I'm here. Happy playing. See you again soon. Thanks for watching.